Hello and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I'm now the proud parent of three houseplants, a snake plant, curly spider plant, and a Boston fern. (laughs) If you know me, you'll know this is quite a feat, because historically I'm a bit of a plant killer. I mean, I managed to kill mint once, for God's sakes. That's meant to be indestructible. It died, anyway. But I bought some houseplants because I'm feeling optimistic about life at the moment. Makes a nice change. And it seems to be a really lovely thing to do these days. Plus, we have just moved into a new flat. Apparently, some plants are meant to be good for purifying the air. The snake plant even releases oxygen at night time. So, in return for the gas that I breathe, I will attempt to not kill them. It's the least I can do. Watch the space. If anyone has any good suggestions for names, let me know. We're currently operating on Spiky Boy, Curly Boy, and Ferny Boy. (laughs) So any creative suggestions are welcome. Also, I shouldn't assume that they're all boys. This has got nothing to do with music at all. What am I going on about? Plants, they're good for your well-being until they die. Okay, moving right along now. My guest this episode is the fabulous violinist Amalia Hall. She's based in New Zealand, but it seems a lot of the time she's elsewhere on the planet fulfilling her busy schedule of performing and recording, as well as preparing for her roles back home as violinist of the New Zealand Trio and concertmaster of Orchestra Wellington. What a CV. I caught up with Amalia while she was in London. Have a listen. So I will say, first of all, welcome to the podcast, Amalia Hall. Thank you. So I feel like I see you quite often in London, despite you not actually living here. You're in London all the time. I think the last time I saw you was about a year ago at your birthday drinks. What brings you to London this time? Well, um, I came back for a very exciting project this time, a recording with the United Strings of Europe. And it's their debut album, and I was lucky enough to be asked to do a piece with them for that. It's called Marilinga, and it's by the Australian composer Matthew Heinsen. I've seen photos on social media, the rehearsal and the recording process, and he is actually there in the rehearsal process. So what's it like being able to work with a composer and actually collaborate with someone who's alive today oh it's incredible it's it's it really makes all the difference I think playing a piece by a living composer there are often so many questions we have I mean the same goes for composers who aren't alive anymore but the the great thing about playing a piece by a living composer is that we can have those questions answered (laughs) and also sometimes pieces can change a little bit I I see composers making revisions of and of course you know even the the romantic composers did revisions of their pieces the Brahms B major trio for example completely revised and and changed and it's very exciting to be able to be a kind of an extended part of that creative process of what composers do and to be able to really get down to the nitty-gritty of what the details of what they want for the piece to sound like. Are you the first person to have recorded it? Um, so the, yes, the first um, commercial recording. Okay, um, I think yeah. there is a performance recording online of Lara St. John with um, Australian Chamber Orchestra. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's quite a privilege, I suppose, to be in that position where you can actually work with a composer. And have there been times where you've spoken to him and just been like, look, this is not working. Can we just try this or give your own suggestions to the piece? Yeah, no, and, and it absolutely is a privilege. Um, and... I met him for the first time last Wednesday, I think it was, Um, so just a a couple of days before the recording. And yeah, you know, as a performer, we always have to figure out a way to make things work. And sometimes it's up to interpretation, like a a staccato dot has so many different meanings, doesn't it? That, you know, there's, there's no one staccato dot. And so I think there were, there were times in the rehearsals or even in the recording where I asked him questions about, um, you know, is it okay if I do it like this? And 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 there were parts when he would suggest something, and and then I'd try that, and it would change the way I saw it, and and open up my eyes to a, a different interpretation, which is great, because it's always so good to try 
a different approach mm. to what we're playing. Well, then I imagine that's how we expand our artistry, isn't it? Absolutely. Just having a, a wider palette of colours to paint with, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully he doesn't get mad at how you interpret that yeah. one staccato oh, dot. <laughs> no, I mean, and he, he is so fantastic to work with and um, I, he just writes amazing music. It was really such a privilege to have him here and to to record his piece yeah I think you need that flexibility if you're going to be a composer working with artists you can't be well I think it can only get you so far if you uh, have written a score for example and then you're Mm. like this is the way it must be because unless you're being really specific with how you've notated something on the page Mm. it is always as you say up for interpretation isn't it Definitely. And it's actually um, so interesting. I was just remembering, uh, uh, I think just over a year ago, I premiered a violin concerto by Michael Norris, a really well-known New Zealand composer. And there was one passage in it which had these arpeggios, semiquavers, um, going from one end of the violin fingerboard to the other end, and repeatedly with very, very difficult intervals and and accidentals. And I practiced it and practiced it, and, and I was trying to get it to sound good and I and eventually I said to him look Michael I I I, I don't think I can do this with the right notes um, <laughs> at, at speed at, because it was very fast as well it was at the end of the the last movement which was a tarantella and oh. inspired by the Sufi um, tradition of whirling dervishes and what is that whir- um, whirling dervishes when they <laughs> twirl around in circles and just continuously for a very long time oh my goodness okay. um and uh, the the music was a bit like that it was really intense and, and full-on and then he said to me well that that was the whole point of it was that I needed to be kind of at the end of what I could possibly do and 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 you know just kind of at the end of my energy and, and it didn't matter about the notes essentially mm. I just needed to make it a, a gesture and so then it yeah. made complete sense to me knowing that <laughs> and I, I had a, a big sense of relief <laughs> that is really really good it's, it's like he's literally notated your sense of struggle and just yep. well the momentum with which one would be whirling around I suppose. definitely yeah. yeah and and he did use that word struggle I think mm-hmm. um, I seem to recall and it made complete sense in what he'd written and of course mm-hmm. composers always have a meaning behind what yeah. they write and it helps us as performers so much to know the meaning of what they're trying to express very wise yeah it can't be too easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah can't be too easy because I mean a, a tarantella is essentially the dance for when people had been bitten by spiders or yes something. yeah that right? they're, i think they were trying to dance out the the poison yeah. <laughs> that would not be my initial reaction if i'd been bitten by a spider no no but i guess you know um you do anything <laughs> you can do to, to stop dying from a tarantula bite <laughs> how many violin concertos have you premiered now two because the first one was by claire cowan oh, who yeah. is a, um you know a yeah. friend of ours yeah. and then the second by michael norris yeah. and so both of them are just really spectacular pieces and both of them were with Orchestra Wellington and Mark Today. Yeah, very, very exciting to get a new score that no one had ever, ever played before. Yeah. Um, it's and opening a Christmas present, isn't totally, it? Totally, <laughs> totally, yeah. It's it's always so nice to, to learn something new. And of course, the traditional repertoire, there are so many cliches or expectations mm. of how we should play things. And of course, there's yeah. a whole, uh, you know, people always trying to move away from those cliches and not necessarily follow expectations but to have this completely new repertoire is you can really make it your own can't you and there isn't that I want to say baggage attached to these old uh, pieces of of repertoire that everyone has those expectations as you say yep and then just to be able to really uh, surprise an audience the new piece. I remember you wore you wore like a really cool hoodie or something, didn't you? Oh for well, Claire's yes, piece? yes. So Claire has such an an amazing creative mind, um, and she runs an ensemble called Blackbird Ensemble where they wear costumes and and it's very theatrical. And she wanted to include some theatrical elements in the concerto as well. And so Elizabeth Whiting, who is this amazing costume designer in New Zealand, she created a costume for me but it wasn't just one it was three different costumes for each of the three movements in the concerto oh so you had to get changed in between yes well <laughs> what happened was um and so that the concerto itself there's a whole um story behind the inspiration for that and it was called the stark concerto because um it was sort of chronicling the the life of frida stark a mm-hmm. dancer in new zealand 
in the 1940s and she used to dance for the American troops wearing only gold body paint, um, <laughs> which caused quite a stir, as you can imagine. She Claire didn't to... make you dress up in only gold no, body paint, did she? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I did have some kind of gold um, glitter paint put on my arms for the performance, actually. But I was also, um, well, I started off for the first movement that was entitled Black, so I wore a long cloak with a hood on it and I was standing on a large plinth barefoot and above the orchestra but also kind of in the middle of the violins to the two violin sections and then after the first movement they dimmed the lights and I pulled one dome on the cloak and then the cloak dropped to the ground. Underneath that was a white gauzy very floaty gown uh, because the second movement was called white. <laughs> oh, and then after that, the lights dim- dimmed after the second movement, and then I pulled a dome, and the ga- the gauzy white dress dropped to the ground, and underneath was a gold dress. <laughs> wow. And well, uh, let me guess, that movement was called gold? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and that was the last one. It was... um. Uh, yeah, the, the last movement. There were no, no movements after that. <laughs> so cool. They're so special. And it just goes to show that a concerto is not just the notes that you play and, and what we hear, but the whole performance that's on stage yeah, as well. Absolutely. And of course, we're used to seeing classical music in a particular way of, you know, the orchestras that the men wear tails and the women wear black and then the soloist wears either a gown or a suit of some kind. But to make it multimedia with different lighting involved because there was different lighting for this concerto as well and it can capture the audience's attention in a different way and it really can reach out to a different audience as well Mm. and I think that's what Blackbird Ensemble have been doing and there's probably more of that happening around the world more and more these days it's really exciting to involve all the different art forms it's like combining music with dance as well live music with dance on stage Mm -hmm. when we want to enhance anything any form of art like a movie or uh, dance or anything really we add music to it don't we and so it's just this pulling together of all these different art forms and and it just means that a wider range of audiences can enjoy it because you might react more to to one thing or another thing or you might just be like absolutely in awe of the entire thing coming together but it can really cross the audience divide I think. Definitely and I think if people start to have an interest in a particular art form no doubt they will also appreciate other art forms as well you know whether it's poetry or visual art or you know the, even and then between different genres as well and I think so much of it can be inspiration for in different ways. Mm -hmm. The way in which, you know, for example, leader songs, they use gorgeous poetry and, and then the the music depicts what the poetry is also expressing and it comes together to, um, to have a a newfound depth for what both the poet and the composer Mm. want to express. That's really special. You must feel very lucky to do what you do. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, I, I really feel very lucky every single day and, and especially, yeah, it's it's a real joy just to share music. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing um, that is rather pertinent to your job, as lucky as you are to do it, is the travel. Mm. So while you are based in New Zealand, I do feel like I see you quite often here in London. Yeah. And before coming to London, you weren't even in New Zealand, you were, you've been to San Francisco, you've recently been to Australia and Argentina, I've been stalking you on social media. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to ask you in particular was how do you deal with the challenges of travel, such as general nomadic vibes, jet lag, and a current international viral plague that is spreading over the globe? How do you deal yeah. with all these different things, but also have to put on a good show as well? Mm. Well, you know, it's happened quite a few times when I arrive in a new country from either a 12-hour flight or even 24 or even up to 30 hours flying perhaps and then just have to go relatively straight to rehearsal that day and um, and just somehow function. I guess that the thing is that I, I just, um, well, I definitely have coffee. <laughs> Goes without saying, but, um, but also... The, there's a special type of focus, I think, which happens when you're in the zone of creating music. And actually, one time, I remember it was a real struggle. Last August, I flew from New Zealand to Sicily, and it was 
at least 24 hours the trip. Oh, it would have been longer, I'm sure. And I, I arrived maybe nine in the morning and I had rehearsal at 11 and then at and I'd met the musicians for the first time mm-hmm. and um, then that evening at nine o'clock we did our first little performance of Schubert uh, Schubert E-flat tr- piano trio which is a pretty hefty piece wow that's, that's a big work <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I do remember I very much struggled to keep my eyes open that evening oh, my um, goodness. I was very tired but I think Actually, what I've what I've found recently uh, is that melatonin can be very helpful for adjusting to time zones. Okay, now what is that exactly? Um, I think it's something. Well, I'm no uh, doctor or pharmacist here, but I think it's something that the body produces to help you realise that it's a specific time you need to be sleepy. So you take melatonin at the times when you need to sleep. Yeah. But- generally you wouldn't because of jet lag yes yeah i mean i think um you know it can help people with insomnia and yeah help with preventing terrible jet lag (laughs) okay but i have certainly been known to also have mammoth sleeps um when i arrive (laughs) i i I think (laughs) yeah (laughs) last week i had a 13 hour sleep when i arrived in california but i only slept two hours on the flight over i think so i was quite tired but i have also slept you know, about 17 hours. <laughs> oh my gosh. Which has happened. That's amazing. That's to rival a cat almost. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then a flurry of activity and rehearsal performance yeah, and then yeah. back to sleep again. Cats must be my spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, I mean, like this added struggle now traveling, you have to get on with your job, obviously, but then travel restrictions to certain places mm. and then also the risk of self-isolation if you've been in contact with particular people or been to particular countries. Is there anything there that you have to deal with on this current trip? Well, luckily so far, no. I haven't been to China or or Italy uh, recently. I think that it's a terrible thing how it is affecting so many people. But I guess there are only the precautions that we can take in in this instance. Um, Washing hands. Yes, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. washing hands a lot. I have seen that um, musicians are having concerts cancelled in Europe and in the States and and it's definitely affecting a lot of people with their travel but in a way it's kind of comforting to be going back to New Zealand tomorrow and know that it is pretty isolated even though there is so much global travel these days and there are many different countries flying to and from New Zealand all the time but it is quite isolated and there's kind of less chance of being close to the spread of the virus Mm -hmm. itself. Have you heard that people are going absolutely mad and just stop piling toilet paper? Yeah, stuff? that's right. It's <laughs> just that's crazy. Yeah. So what are you going to do with all that toilet paper? You're oh, not going to need to go to the toilet that many times. No, no. And is, is, it, is it even part of the symptoms? Of I, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I, yeah, other than just going to the bathroom normally, yeah. I don't think it is. I wonder if they're stocking up on tuna tins and bottled water as well, you know, in case they yeah. don't want to go out to a supermarket. Maybe. Well, you know what? I've not heard so much about like canned goods, which mm. in my mind, I think that would be first. But yeah. I've been hearing about people stockpiling toilet paper yeah. and pasta and rice. Oh. So it's like you're just going to eat loads of carbs and yeah. then just need to go to the toilet <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You'd probably stockpile ice cream or something. That's you? right. <laughs> so what's one of your favourite travel destinations that music has brought you to? Oh, well, definitely Italy. I love going to Italy. The gelato. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely at the top of the list. And the people and the, the pizza. And there is so much history there. Mm. Um, beautiful theatres as well. Even in small towns, there can be these gorgeous theatres. Kind of smaller versions of what you can picture of the La Scala, you know, mm. with, with the different levels and very opulent looking with the red velvet curtains and gold detailing and so on. And there's such a rich musical history there as well. Definitely. And I imagine for me, especially coming from New Zealand and yourself as well, but it's really special to go to a venue that has been standing there for hundreds and hundreds Mm. of years. And an old venue in New Zealand would be maybe 150 years old. Absolutely. Which is quite impressive. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But just to... To know that you, you know, you're perhaps performing in a venue that the star of the 17th century or something shared the stage. Yeah, definitely. Well, actually, there's a theatre in Verona where I've performed a few times, and that was the place where apparently Mozart first performed on his very first tour to Italy. (laughs) And, you know, there are just sweet things like that where 
you know, it's, it's the thought of who who has performed here. Mm. It really um, connects you with the past, doesn't mm, it? And it, it connects you with this score that's in front of you. Yeah. Of, of this composer. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. I'd love to go to Italy, but I don't think it's very possible at this point of time. Yeah, not, not the best time. <laughs> yeah. As we mentioned before, you travel so much and often under trying circumstances. <laughs> what do you do specifically to keep your physical and mental well-being in check? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think that, you know, travel can often raise not the best situations sometimes. It can make you very tired and you're walking through a, a, an airport with your suitcase and violin and it can be um, very trying on your patience. <laughs> so I think that generally I just try to stay as relaxed and calm as possible when I travel. Yeah, just to just to try and adjust into the new time zone as quickly as possible when I arrive somewhere. Mm -hmm. Melatonin. Um, yes, yeah, definitely. How do you stay calm though? Because I get really, really grumpy after I've been on a plane for so long. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I can as well. But um, <laughs> I, I think I'm always looking forward to where I'm going. You mm -hmm. know, when I leave New Zealand, it's really exciting to be going to another country and to be going for a specific concert or festival. And then when I go back to New Zealand, I have home to look forward to. Yeah. And so it's always just, I, I, I always feel excited yeah. to be flying different places. Even now, you know, every time is, is still exciting for different reasons. And it can be really nice to meet new people sitting next to them on flights. And of course, sometimes I feel like not talking to anyone. Yeah. And, and <laughs> That's when you put the headphones on yeah. and you're like, right, I'm just going to music. I've, I've got loads of music to learn. I'm just really busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, different things can happen. Like I remember once just standing up to leave the plane, a lady saw me getting my violin down from the overhead locker. And she was asking me about being a violinist just before they opened the doors. You know, we only had a very short conversation and it turned out that her son wanted to become a musician and mm. she had been trying to discourage him because she said, no, no, it's not a good career path to take. And I, and I said oh. to her, well, look, of course, it's not a guaranteed stable career path, but if it's what he loves to do, if he's determined to work hard and, and if he has the talent and, and um, dedication for it, then it is so rewarding. Like I cannot imagine doing anything else apart from music. My goodness, yeah. And within this three or four minute conversation, by the end she said, oh, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to support my son in whatever he wants to do now. That's so nice <laughs> to hear. It's, yeah. it's like she was meant to meet you on that flight. Yeah. I think. And it was so special to know that, okay, maybe that, that boy can now feel great about doing music and about who knows where he's going to go. <laughs> oh, wow. Wouldn't it be funny if you if you met him one day? Yeah, absolutely. Like, my mum was not approving of my musical career. But then she met some violinist on a plane who said that <laughs> she should support me. <laughs> That's really cool. So you're going back home to New Zealand tomorrow. What do you do to relax? I do like to go running, but I think I went about four times last year. <laughs> <laughs> I do like to just chill out and do nothing and watch Netflix or mm -hmm. um, just spend time with my, my family, my boyfriend mm -hmm. and um, catch up with friends. Yeah. It's really important to switch one's brain off. Yeah. Connecting with nature. I do find oh, yeah. when I go yeah. home to New Zealand and, and being close to the water, just going to the beach is one of my favorite things to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> being close to the water is so important, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's one thing I really miss about well, when I live here in London, you have the Thames. It's not quite the same. <laughs> yeah. I always love going back to the beach. Yeah. What's definitely. your favourite beach in Auckland? Mm, Long Bay, I think, because, mm -hmm. um, well, it is one of the local beaches to where I live, but also the, the cliff path is so beautiful for going running there. Oh, but then the West Coast beaches too. Oh, the black mm, sand? Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. And, yeah. 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 Good times at Pihar. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So speaking of being really busy at home, so the times that you're not connecting with nature or mm -hmm. catching up with friends, you have several roles that you need to fulfill yeah. back home. So I think you're probably one of the most versatile violinists that I know because you're working as a soloist overseas and recording, but you're also concertmaster of Orchestra Wellington That's and great. chamber musician. Um, you're the violinist of New Zealand Trio. So how much of a gear shift is it between these different roles? 
Well, you know, I think they are all actually so interconnected. In, in order to be a good concert master, I have to lead the section and be kind of a little bit demonstrative in the in the way I show what we what we're doing and and mm-hmm. show the how we're using the bow and and so in a way that connects to being a soloist because everything has to be a little bit larger than life sometimes in order to yeah. yeah in order to stand up as a single voice against the full symphony orchestra but also part of being a concert master means blending and being a good chamber musician so that you don't just hear one <laughs> one violin of the first violin sticking yeah, yeah. out very loudly. <laughs> Why is everyone playing wrong apart from me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then for chamber, you know, being a good chamber musician, you have to blend the voices and and create a tapestry of sound rather than just playing in your own way as a soloist. Mm-hmm. But of course, also being a soloist you do want to forge a relationship with the orchestra and and create a, a unified sort of... Well, for example, this last weekend when I was playing with the United Strings of Europe, that very much felt like chamber music, mm-hmm. um, even though I was in the solo role. And it's so nice to feel the connection with the orchestra in that way. Um, yeah. That way it's not a faceless ensemble, but you definitely. are working with individuals to become a, you know, a cohesive unit. Yeah, definitely. And the com- it's the communication, really, isn't it? Yeah. You have to be such a effective communicator in all these different roles, I Definitely, imagine. yeah. And I find that for the first rehearsal as a soloist doing a concerto with an orchestra, I prefer, if possible, um, often to stand and face the orchestra and feel the connection even more that way. And, of course, I can't do that for the concert. <laughs> then I'm just using my ears mainly, unless I use my peripheral vision to look back a bit. But also it makes me feel more grounded and centred and and sure of what I'm doing musically mm-hmm. to be aware of all the different orchestral parts. And the same goes for chamber music too, just being aware mm-hmm. of what everyone is playing. Is and I imagine it must be really nice for the orchestral members to make that contact with you. You know, they're not just turning up and just to play this sort of canvas upon which you put your solo part to but they can yeah. you know there's a horn solo you make eye contact with the horn play and it's like oh yes we're making yeah. music together yeah. I've never met you before but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and of course the color of the orchestration can can really determine what sort of um, sound or character I should create as the soloist you know if it is a, a duo with a flute or or if mm. The horn has just stated the theme that I'm about to take over or um, anything like that. It, it can really be so helpful to know that. I have to ask one question, mostly for me. What's it like working with Ashley Brown, my previous teacher? I'm just curious because he was in a teaching role when we were at uni together at Auckland. And now what, what's it like working with someone who used to have that role, but now as your peer? Mm. Well, that's the interesting thing about becoming a professional after being a student, you know, (laughs) and I also had the same kind of situation with uh, James Tennant and Catherine Austin Mm -hmm. at uh, Waikato University when I was teaching there and playing chamber music with them. And of course, they were my chamber music coaches during all of my teenage years. And then, you know, a number of years later, then they become (laughs) my colleagues. And it is something that I had to adjust to. And of course, keeping the respect I have for them as musicians, but then also feeling comfortable to consider them as my Mm -hmm. colleagues and to be open with my own ideas. Yeah, open with your own ideas, feeling confident in your own ideas, especially when you're trying to communicate them to someone who, you know, planted that seed in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Yeah. That all of a sudden you have to hold your own ground. Yeah. Like, I am my own person. I'm not your student anymore. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and I've I've found that um, any of the musicians I've worked with in recent years have been incredibly respectful to me mm-hmm. and uh, supportive, and they always have been. So I feel very lucky that I haven't felt downtrodden or, or yeah. anything like that. Um it very much is a collaboration and and we just feed off each other's ideas, which yeah. is really, really nice. Well, you have to respect the people that you're working with no matter what, mm, don't you? Definitely. So no one is going to give off their best results if they feel like they're being talked down to. No. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or if, if you're ever working with someone who feels like they've got all the answers to everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a collaboration. No. Anymore, is it? <laughs> The 
this is one segment that I always have in my podcast episodes, and it's called the wild card question round. Oh, sounds intriguing. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you are intrigued. So this is where you have the opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three topics that I present you. Wow. <laughs> smiling and nodding, smiling and <laughs> nodding. Okay, so the first topic is, and you can just choose one, dream repertoire. We have what I'm following on social media and ice cream. <laughs> they are tailored somewhat to the guests that I interview. <laughs> oh, that's very funny. Oh, let's go with what I'm following on social media. Oh, I thought you were going to choose ice cream. That's fine. We can I, talk I, about... I could have we, we very can... easily. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is your favorite account to follow on Instagram? Oh, well, I've been really enjoying what, um, seeing what Nicola Benedetti has been posting, actually, with, oh, gosh, with the yeah. sessions that she's been running. Um, it's amazing to see so many kids involved and of different ages, different levels. Just run for those who don't know, what exactly is she doing? Because I've seen photos of her surrounded by like what seems like a billion violinists. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe it's a program called, maybe called the Benedetti Sessions, where kids can apply and there are different um, level groups and ensemble orchestras and they have master classes and just coachings and, and all sorts of things run by Nicola and I think that it seems to be hugely inspiring to this generation um, mm. of younger students rising up. She's really inspiring isn't she because yeah. she's, she's even said that society really does undervalue music teachers yep. and she's actively trying to change that yeah. I think and it's just nice to see pictures of her being actively involved in you know the future of these young violinists yeah, yeah. absolutely is that something you think you would like to do <laughs> yeah well I, I love um, working with with kids and and teaching and working with with orchestras and so on as well it is it is really fun to feel that, um, you know, you can really hear and see the results mm. quite quickly sometimes. And kids are like sponges. They, <laughs> if they're interested in what they're doing, they can just soak up information and be so enthusiastic. Mm. In Argentina, when I was there recently, we were working with uh, students of different ages. There were two different orchestras, um, ages 10 to 18 and 18 to 28, something like that anyway. And they were so enthusiastic and just really wanted to learn and it was really great to see that. And, and of course, not every person who grows up playing an instrument will become a professional musician, but it can bring them so much satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It can be so great for their brain development and for their social development. And to and appreciate art. Absolutely. Elsewhere in life. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. it's not the point just to create more and more musicians, but it's to appreciate beauty in the world definitely well. yeah and it, it just improves life quality <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first <laughs> that's really nice to hear my answer for what I'm following on social media is very very different from yours oh yeah <laughs> so one of my most recently followed accounts is um, an animal account oh well I follow plenty of those too <laughs> so I, I think it, it may be getting to the point where I'm following more animals than humans it's called round boys Oh, and it's just round, small animals. Oh, you might really I might, like it. I might it. have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, round dot boys. Okay, but there's like videos of pandas just like rolling down oh. hills, and like animals. I don't even know what they are because you can't see their <laughs> heads. <laughs> Chinchillas, cats. It's brilliant. So yeah. that's that's a good thing to you know if you want to just like switch your brain off, yeah. not think about anything else. Yeah, but just, definitely. Yeah, round it boys. definitely always puts you in a good mood. <laughs> yeah, totally. Thank you so much for your oh, insights my on pleasure. your life as a soloist, a chain musician and concertmaster, as well as your experiences traveling and making music around the world. So where can people follow you and find out more about what you're up to? Oh, well, I do um, post on social media. Um, I have Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. My username is Amalia Violin, all one word. 
And I do have a website that is terribly out of date. Uh, everyone <laughs> says that. I feel like everyone's quite rubbish at, at keeping their websites yeah, up to date. Yeah, websites seem to be very last century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I say this every single episode, but I still have not done anything about my website for this podcast. So, Oh, maybe it's time soon. <laughs> maybe. Wonderful to chat to you. Thank yeah, you so no much place. for being on the podcast, Amalia. My, my pleasure. Thanks, Davina. That was my conversation with Amalia. I've said this before. One thing I love about doing a podcast is that it gives me a chance to catch up with old friends, and we chatted long after recording. Good times. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from Kiwi pianist Ellie, who lives in the UK, and says, Music College didn't prepare me for getting sick all the time when I started teaching. Having finished college and doing a little bit of teaching to pay the rent and bills, I decided to increase my hours and make it into a proper job. What followed, after one week, was a sore throat, which continued for six months. On the off chance that it wasn't a virus, my mum insisted I went to a GP. This being New Zealand, where you have to pay for primary care up front, so you'd never go to the doctor for a mere sore throat. The doctor examined me, and his official medical opinion was that I was suffering from bad luck. That insightful diagnosis cost me $60. However, 60 bucks did get me some good advice. He taught me how to wash my hands properly. I'm so well practiced in proper hand washing that the COVID-19 virus has not changed my behavior one bit. I continued to get sick pretty consistently for two years after I started teaching, and then it subsided, until I moved to the UK and my immune system suffered under a deluge of new bugs for another two years. Now I insist that my students wash their hands before touching my piano, so I've stopped getting sick so often. Thanks, Ellie, for your contribution. If you're a music teacher in any capacity at all, I'm sure you've encountered the horrors of snotty children. The ones that turn up with visible dried mucus encrusted around their nostrils and upper lip. The ones that cough wetly into their hands, <coughs> pick up their instrument, hand it to you and say, Miss, can you chew my cello? I've been known to say to students, uh, do you want to just go and blow your nose really quickly while they're sniffing away? Meanwhile, I drench my hands in hand sanitizer as they leave the room. Coronavirus or not, we all need to practice good hygiene. I'm tired of getting sick during half term because that's when my immune system decides to give up the ghost and let all those nasty bugs bring me down. And this doesn't pertain only to children. I've definitely witnessed some adults who could improve on the whole hand washing front after going to the loo. Then you end up playing with them in orchestra. There they are playing an instrument with their dirty hands. Why is it in bathrooms there's always a pull handle on the door that you have to touch after you've washed your hands? Why isn't it the other way around? A push panel that you can just shove with your shoulder to get out? So many questions. If you have an experience that Music College didn't prepare you for that you'd like to share or have discussed on the podcast, then let me know. As it comes podcast at gmail.com. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Huge thanks to Amalia Hall for setting aside a rare window of time not spent playing the violin or sitting on a plane to chat to me. And as always, thank you for listening. Do get in touch. It's always nice to hear from you. As it comes, podcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the podcast and assistant producer Romeo's latest hijinks on Facebook and Instagram at As It Comes Pod. Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word, not the germs. Leave some toilet paper for the rest of society. Chat to you soon. Bye. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, um, funnily enough, I actually had an ice cream from the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> really? What kind of ice cream was it? It was Cornish salted clotted cream. Wow. <laughs> there was one left and I needed to eat it up and, uh, and I didn't have anything else. Oh, well, actually there was muesli, but I didn't feel like eating muesli. <laughs> That's one of the great things about being an adult, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. You can choose. Ice cream for breakfast. Yeah, definitely. That's just that's classic you yeah, as well. And yeah. also, it's like the middle of winter. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
emerging into spring. Definitely. That you were having. 